It's the Professional Life Advice Show with your host, Will Strickland. Professional Life Advice, where you too can be a professional. Hello, viewers. My name is Will Strickland of Pro Life Advice, where you too can have a professional lifestyle. I'm here today with Luther Wright. What's up? What's up? What's up, Will? All right. How you doing? How the brother? So, good, so, man. so, Big Lou, you got a lot of attributes. They call you Luther Wright. Mm -hmm. They call you Lou B. DJ Lou B. <laughs> Big Lou. Hey, I, I can only be one person. Though. I'm Luther Wright, and I'm, I'm very happy f to be in this position here on this uh, fantastic TV show, and I'm looking forward to. You know, just getting this interview and giving you what I can give you and let the world know that I'm I'm still alive. That's all right, all right, just all right. To put that out there. Now, now Lou, <laughs> I've been checking you out over the years. I remember back in the day you were a star athlete at uh, what is that Seton Hall? Seton Hall University. Okay. Pirates, Pirates for life. All right. What position did you play back at Seton Hall? Center. I was a highly sought after high school senior, and I chose to go to Seton Hall so that I could play close at home mm -hmm. and bring some fame and. A little fortune to my hometown in New Jersey. You know, New Jersey stand up. I'm a New Jersey kid. Now, when you mentioned high school, what high school did you go to? Let's just back Went to St. Anthony's bit. High School for my freshman year. St. Anthony's, all right. They got a lot of great ball players yeah. coming out of St. Anthony's. I transferred out of there and went to Elizabeth High School. And you were born where? where in North? Jersey City. Jersey City. Yeah, raised okay. in North. Shout out to Brick City. Brick City in the building. All day. All right. So since you got into the basketball world, right after, right after Seton Hall, what, what, where did you go from, from there? Got drafted in 1993 by the Utah Jazz with the 18th pick of the first round. Wow. Yes. Excellent. How was that experience? Feeling an experience I'll never forget, and I try to share with as many people as I can. That's something that no one could ever say or take away from me. I was the first round draft pick of the NBA. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, that's 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 history right there. History. Especially when you're looking at our you know young black athletes coming out today. Now, now Luther, I'm gonna just move forward a little bit. Um, when you played with the Utah Jazz, uh, in between that time, have you ever played any ball overseas? I had a tryout. I went on a like a Try out tour with some other uh, form, uh, ball players, and I really didn't like the overseas scene, so I, I stayed over there for like a month or two, and then I came back home and got got into my music a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, went astray a little bit. Got uh, had had uh, addiction issues and things like that. But excuse me, God is good. God is good. I said before you clean and sober. Eight years, like. Where's my phone? I've been clean for proper for exactly. I turned the phone off. It's gonna take a minute. Cause I like sharing with people, uh, you know, about my clean time and <clears throat> my, you know, my battles and struggles with addiction. Because I think if a person hears me tell my story and share, you know, some of the good and the bad and the ugly experiences that I had with addiction, you know, I, I feel like I can be a help. Okay. A, a lot of people. Excellent. That's that's very 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 brave. I mean, that was some of the questions that we were thinking about talking about okay. here in Pro Life Advice, but we I'm actually trying, wasn't trying to keep uh, it clean. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, well, we, man, we, I appreciate you know because I, mean, I appreciate you that uh, mm -hmm. in, in that light because a lot of people they all all they want to focus on is the negative and the you know the bad choices that I made and you know some of the pitfalls that I found myself into, they really want to focus on those things. Well, here's the thing. To God be the glory, Amen. you're on top right now. Amen. Amen. Look at you. Hey, I'm 7'2", so I'm always on top. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I like <laughs> no, that. Real so, you so, right. so let's move, let's move ahead. So, right now, some of the things that you're doing, I, I mean, I saw you on Channel 12 News, and you, you were uh, with, with one of the guys on Channel 12. You, you have a book out now called The Perfect Fit? Called Perfect tell Fit. Us, tell our viewers a little bit about Perfect Fit. Well, uh, Perfect you know. Fit is a memoir. Shout out to Cameron Hunter and Cameron Hunter Publishing Company. They helped me put together this fantastic book mm -hmm. that um, I'm sharing with the world. It's just a memoir about my life, you know, the truth about Luther Wright. I don't want to really go into details about the book. Yeah, that's but I recommend the <laughs> that book for people that have a loved one that's struggling with, you know, life, life issues, uh, uh, life on life term issues. Um, it's definitely a good read and it, it, you will get to know me better. So I thought they wanted to get one of these and take me home with you. <laughs> now on that note, let's we're, we're going to take two seconds out to give a real shout out about the book. How do they get the book? Is it available at Barnes and Nobles? How, how do they yes, pick it up? The book is available everywhere. I got them in the trunk, but they're available. That's at an entrepreneur right there. <laughs> they're available at Barnes and Nobles, 
Uh, Amazon.com. Amazon, okay. You go to my website, www.lw50.com. Uh, you could you could contact me here at the studio Black Wax. Uh, our website is www.blackwax. That's with two X's. Dot com. Um, I'm not giving out my phone number. I, I see y'all looking. <laughs> like, <laughs> you can be like Mike yeah. Jones and give. No, I ain't Mike, Mike Jones. Jones gave out a my name Luther Wright. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't Mike Luther, Jones. Luther Wright in the house. <laughs> so so listen right now. I came to visit you here in Jersey City, and I see you working on, on in the studio. Uh, tell us about your DJ life. Oh, my DJ life is is pretty is pretty hectic a little bit. You know, I'm, I'm really trying to get, you know, uh, create a, a vast audience for me to play in front of. I, I think I'm one of the more skilled uh, hip hop DJs, but I could play club music too. I was actually when we walked in working on a club track, um, and. I mean, I DJ, I do it for fun, but I also do it for, it's, it's like a sport to me. I, cause I try to, I do a lot of tricks and stuff like that, cutting and scratching and things like that nature. Shout out to Antoine Quar, I'm trying to get up with you, bro. <laughs> but, um, yeah, he was on my show. Now, let me ask you, when, when you when you mentioned Antoine Quar a minute ago, um, let's let's roll back a little bit. As far as the DJing, I know you probably got basketball influences uh, from here to California, but what influenced you to go into the music? How did you really start... The music and the music I've been here playing and playing music, music and man, DJing. Since I was five years old, I'm a, I'm a pretty wow. good musician as well. I play lead guitar, bass guitar, I play drums. Wow. So okay. music has always been like an outlet for me mm -hmm. to you know escape some of the issues that I had growing up as a child. But well, were there any influences like mom or pops? Anybody um, playing instruments? Pops made sure that I kept. He kept some instruments in the house. He made mm -hmm. sure I practiced daily. Mm -hmm. um, my mom had a, had her own gospel group, so I got a chance to oh, phenomenal. hear music and learn how to play at her <laughs> Shout out to moms and the to gospel. Mom Dukes, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I've been around music all my life. My mom used to play Aretha Franklin, Sam Cooke, Otis Redden, the old school James stuff. Brown, you know, all that, all that classic music that yeah. they don't make no more, but it's still classic. So I get a chance to uh, uh, listen to all those things growing up, and then it just became a part of me. You know, I always wanted to do music. Okay. Now, tell us a little bit more about your your DJ life. I mean, you, you have a radio show. You on the air? What I'm on the internet. I have an internet radio show mm -hmm. called The Bounce. Um, Big Lou presents The Bounce. I have a record label now. We're working on the logos and things of that nature. Big Lou Records. And I'm here with um, Black Wax Entertainment Company. We're uh, we just we're more than music. We do movies. We do movie scores. Um, mm -hmm. We have a full fledged operating studio here. Um, we have cameras all over the place, the green rooms in the front. Um, shout out to you, Xavier Tyrone Washington is his name, and he's the he's my partner here at uh, Black Wax Studios, and we just, I mean, I just recently started coming here and working, but they kind of like opened their arms to me, and it's, it's been a beautiful thing. I come in and I get some things done. I, I, I'm recruiting artists as we speak. I'm doing a few compilations I got coming out. I'm going to do some gospel things. Okay. Some clap, some house music, and mo mo mostly hip hop though. But um, I'm looking for spoken word artists. I'm looking for poets. I'm looking for uh, uh, actresses and actors and. Uh, Audience, are you getting this? You, know what I mean? you could be a star with Luther, right? Here. Trying to do it. All right. So listen, I have I have a couple more questions before we go. What are some of the things that if, if you could just close your eyes and see yourself in in the future five years from now, he's closing his eyes. Where would you be? If you could just open up your eyes in five years from now, where would you be? I'd be the executive of my of my official multimedia group. Mm. I would have maybe two or three movies under my belt that I directed. Wow. Okay. Um, right. I, I probably wrote another another book or two. Um, probably be a sought after hip hop DJ or radio personality on a on a bigger scale. Um, have my own mentoring program. Maybe I like some that. basketball. Mentoring. Excellent. You know, just doing things to give back to my community and show kids that life is not all about sports. Right, right, right. Other things. That's what pro-life advice is really about, giving back and giving some advice. And before we go, just give a little bit of advice to the community. Um, if You know, you, you're obviously an, an excellent entrepreneur. You, you, you have a mindset for business. Um, just give, give the audience a little bit of advice on if anyone who's really going into business or looking to be in the music world, what, what kind of attitude or some of the things you can just tell them what they need to well, know. I learned that if you find something you love and you make people pay you for it, you will never have to work another day in your life. So music is my passion, music is my love, and I'm going to make it 
work for me and put some money in the bank for me. Excellent. Straight from the heart, from Luther Wright. Luther, thanks for being on the show. And before I get out of here, I'd like to thank Pro-Life Advice and Will Strickland for having me on the show this evening. I'm about to go home and go to sleep, but <laughs> stay tuned in. His brother's going places and he's doing big things in the community and he's giving back like myself. Shout out to Tylon Washington and his whole family here at Black Rice Studios. And we out of here. Peace. All right. Pro-Life Advice, where you too can be a professional. Thank you. Hello viewers and thank you for tuning in again at Pro-Life Advice, where you too can be a professional. My name is Will Strickland and we're going to take a stroll down to Wickway Park in the heart of Newark, New Jersey to take a look at the hit Smash Dance music track from Bootsy. She flew all the way in from South Africa and she's going to do a little bit of Superman down in Wickway Park. And here's the video from Wickway. <laughs>
Say, how's it feel to be in the in, in U.S.? Uh, my name is Nigeria. How's it feel to be in U.S.? How's it feel to be in U.S.? I don't know if there was a word to express. I don't think there's a word to express the feeling. I heard you I say something think. about goosebumps when you stepped up on the stage. And even goosebumps just don't explain. It's, it's too much. It's overwhelming. You know, because I'm from South Africa and I had no idea that I would come to America and have so many people love my song. Just one yeah. song. Yeah. In a, in a, all right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me get you one more time. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Will Strickland. I'm here today with Tina Graham, a native of Newark, New Jersey. She's one of our own, and she does a lot of things in Newark with comedians and comedy in the state of Newark, New Jersey, as well as New York, Philadelphia, and so on. Tina, say hi. Hi. Hi, everybody. <laughs> All right, so Tina, tell me, you've been doing a lot of comedy. I mean, how long have you been in comedy? I mean, how long have you been managing comedy, comedians? She's brought several comedians uh, way back to the Peppermint days. Yeah, before the Peppermint, yes. Uh, since uh, 1988, I kind of stumbled into a place called Terminal D. Terminal D, yeah. okay, yeah, I remember that. That's on 1 and 9, Elizabeth. Oh, uh, yes, uh, okay. Freeland Heisen Avenue. Freeland Heisen Avenue, And uh, it was like new, you know, in the 80s, you had Eddie Murphy and Richard Pryor. And, someone in mm -hmm. Red Fox. And, but it was amazing to see how many comedians it was. It just under underground. Okay. So I constantly started to nurture other comics and I started going to this place called the Uptown Comic Club in Harlem. Right, right. I remember So they that. gave me a job and it was nurturing comedians. They had workshops and they were and sketch comedy and they, not only was they doing um, underground comedy, they were doing underground hip hop. Wow. So it became bigger and bigger and comedians was coming from all over the country when they found out that there was somewhere that they could go to do comedy Ooh. as uh, urban. Because it was hard to get into mainstream rooms like Caroline's and Dangerfields and Catch a Rising Star. The urban comics couldn't get in those clubs. So they created something for themselves and lo and behold, they got a deal. I started working at Showtime at the Apollo. Ooh. And then I went from there to Uptown Comic Club and then they came a uh, development deal for a deaf comedy jam. Okay, yeah. now when you were at these various nightclubs, were, were, I mean you were just, at that particular time, were you hanging out or were you managing comedians? What, what was your Actually, goal at that I mean, particular time? Actually, I mean, I grew as the, as the comedians grew. Okay. So I came up with like, uh, at the time, it was Flex Alexander, mm -hmm. um, the Brown Brothers from Uptown Comedy Club, they owned the comedy club. Right. And uh, it became famous. You had um, Tracy Morgan, um, Mike Epps, uh, Bill Bellamy. Uh, right. You know, these people that's famous now. Kevin Hart. Mm -hmm. So, Tina, I, I know you were born in Newark. Yes. A native of Newark. I was born in Newark, okay. but I was raised in North Carolina. North Carolina, yeah. okay. A little small town called Clarkton. I went to Clarkton High School. That's, yeah. All right. So, so listen, tell us about how long you've been involved in this, in the uh, comedy field and how did you get started? Actually, I started in, um, in the early 80s, uh, around 85, in fashion and music and then it escalated to comedy around 1988. Okay. And uh, I fell into a little comedy spot called Terminal D, which was, they just was trying out something new. Mm 
Yeah, I remember Terminal D. That's yeah. out on 1 and 9 Elizabeth. Was, yeah. yeah, it was on uh, Freeland Heights Avenue in Freeland Elizabeth. Okay. And then I started going to, uh, I met a guy named Bob Sumner. And he told me about another comedy spot. I was so interested in, in the comedy, urban comedy, because I was not used to seeing that many comedians other than Eddie Murphy, you know. Mm. So I started getting to know all the comedians, and I started uh, my own spot in Linden, New Jersey, called Linden Hall. Mm. And I started getting the comedians from um, this place called the Uptown Comedy Club in Harlem. And they were doing comedy every Sunday. They did workshops. They were developing comedians, and it got so popular. People was the comedians were coming from Chicago, or Houston, Texas. I would get to know all the comedians. Yeah, I remember there was one time Bill Bellamy. I ran into him mm -hmm. when he was actually still a student at Rutgers. He said, "Well, I'm going over to this club in New York in Harlem." Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So when um, um, Bob got a job at Def Jam Records and. It's the comedy got so popular, Puffy, all, all the rappers was hanging there. Right, I remember yeah. Def Jam and as well. I, yeah, they all got to know, I got to know everybody there, and then all of a sudden, I got a job at Showtime with the Apollo, and uh, Uptown Comedy Club got a deal on Fox, and then Russell Simmons got a deal with HBO. Wow, and yeah, I remember that, that ran for quite some time, that yeah. HBO and the uh, Def Jam comedy review. That was, that was pretty hot for a long time. I saw you and Bob Summers really branching off at that time. And I went on to work for other TV shows afterwards. I worked for Laugh Palooza. Mm. We had another show on, um, I worked for Uptown Comedy Club TV show. Then I went from there to Def Comedy Jam for until 2006. And then I went to um, Bill Bellamy's Who's Got Jokes, which was on uh, TV One. Yeah, right, so I'm right. a talent producer. I'm, I have another show coming out, hopefully in the fall on Showtime called Comedy Underground. Okay. So, now, yeah. Tina, since this is an advice channel, pro-life advice, professional life advice. Tell us a little bit of advice that you can give, as, because there are a lot of comedians out there. There's a lot of people who think they have jokes or want to have jokes or trying to tell jokes. I mean, it, Will Strickland here, he's, every now and then I got a couple of jokes, but what, what, what can you tell the comedians as far as if they're looking to come out and it be original and be unique and be different? What, what, can you, what kind of clues can you, or pointers can you give? You're pretty much said it up. Oh, you have to be unique and funny. You know, you have to be original. Because it's so many comedians now, so many as people aspire to be comedians, they think it's easy, but it's not. The hardest thing in the world is make people laugh, especially thousands of people. Because even if you've got a hundred people in the room, you're never going to make everybody laugh. Right. So you have to go with the 80 20. But the key to it is writing and being different and having standing out more than the next person. You got to persevere and have good timing and just uh, have a great sense of humor and find humor in it. Pretty much anything, politics, life, you know, in general. And just, you know, give your point of view. And it has to be funny. So the key to it is to continue to write and be different. You know, per perseverance in, in this business is a hard job. And, you know, it's a lot of sacrifice in comedy. Right. You know, so it's, it's and, you know, it's getting to know people and becoming a people person and just traveling the, the country and, getting to know every individual. You have to be universal because you, in order to do television, you have to be able to appeal to every audience, young, old, indifferent, white, black, Hispanic, Chinese, it doesn't matter. You have to be diverse in this business and you have to, you know, uh, it's, it takes a tough skin to deal with the comedy, you know, just right, the inside right. business and just being able to create and be different and better than the next person. Okay. now. Let's get a little bit involved in who Tina Graham is. Now, Tina, so what are some of the things that you're currently involved in here in the city of Newark, and what are some of the things that you're looking to do as far as like some of your short-term goals maybe you're looking to do in, in, in the future regarding comedy? Well, I've been doing a lot of fundraising for autism children hmm. and autism. Excellent. And I've been doing, um, I do a charity event every year, um, the last one I did for um, breast cancer. I do these big celebrity fashion shows. I told you I started in fashion and went from fashion to music to comedy. Right. So I, I combined the comedy and the fashion together. Okay. And I have all the comedians from Kevin Hart to Bill Bellamy to um, Hamburger to all the comedians that I've met over the years Your boy across Capone the country. The show is be in Capone, the <laughs> all of them, and talent hosts the show for me. Okay. And, um, and they come together, two, three hundred comedians come together and hit the runway. Wow. I mean, and I have all the uh, name designers from Academics to Pele, Pele, Fat Farm. They all contribute clothes to the show and we raise the money and give it to charity. So this year I'm going to go with um, you know, the gay and lesbian community and raise uh, 
uh, money for HIV awareness mm -hmm. and, you know, a, a, trying to find a cure, you know, for Excellent. HIV. So, you know, this year is probably going to be here at the Robert Tree. <laughs> the last one wow. we did was at the Robert Tree. And most likely uh, either Mike Epps or Talent will probably host it and probably get Kim Whitley mm -hmm. um, to, to co-host. She was from um, Friday. Now, now, what are some of your long-term goals? I mean, are you, are you looking to do your own Tina's Comedy Club? I can see that in the future. Actually, Tina's I had a radio show called <laughs> Laughter and Legends. I had a radio show, internet radio show. I thought about doing a talk show. But right now, I'm going to write a book. So okay. I've got a couple of yeah, chronicles I need to write about. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Tina, I want to thank you for coming on the Professional Life Advice Show here mm -hmm. with out of uh, Newark, New Jersey. Again, Stick around and do some positive things in your life, like Miss Tina Graham here. She's an entrepreneur. She's a writer. She's a living legend in the city of Newark, New Jersey. She's dealt with several comedians, Steve Harvey, to, to, to name several different comedians that passed through way back in the day at the Peppermint Lounge. I remember when Steve Harvey first came down to, to the Peppermint with his little Afro and his country accent. And now look at him. And Tina's actually been directly involved with a lot of comedians. When I, I know I've, I've been backstage at some shows and I mentioned her name. And they said, Tina Graham? Tina Graham? <laughs> Mike Epps is like, Tina Graham? In? Where's Tina Graham? Go get Tina Graham. Bring her back here right away. So this is a phenomenal woman. And we're looking for her to do some phenomenal things in the near future. Again, thank you for tuning in to Pro Life Advice, where you too can have a professional life like Miss Tina Graham. Thank you. Well, thank you. Hi, my name is Joseph. I would like to share some of the talent that God has chosen to bless me with with you. First off, a lot of people think of an ink pen as just an ink pen. I want to let you know that my pen is so much more. <laughs> A pen. A man invented piece of plastic with a metal ball tip that was created to spread ink. It is used mainly in schools and in businesses that cost like two for a dollar, I think. But when it is placed into the right hands, something special happens. You see, in my Bible, when Jesus anointed the disciples and on the day of Pentecost, they began to glow and to speak in different tongues. So a bick is now no longer a bick when it is placed into the hands of an anointed one. I am an anointed son, and my pen is not a pen. It is my weapon, my tool, and my rod. It is not a man-invented piece of plastic with a metal ball tip, you see, because to me it is my gift from God. You see, the power is not me, yet it is in me, and I believe that I can, so if I stretch out my pen, my friend, like Moses, I too can part the Red Sea. My faith is much bigger than the size of a mustard seed, so I can point my pen at any mountain and have it removed. I can turn two fish into enough food to feed a multitude. I can slay giants if I'm called to. Jesus Christ, he's that dude. I'm just happy to be used as his vessel to work through. My staff, my partner, my friend, tear down this temple and in three days it shall rise back up again. If there is one here today who finds it hard to comprehend through faith, God has given me power and my power flows through. Ah, my pen, a pen, a priceless gift from God combined with talent and power. My weapon, my tool, my rod, my staff, my partner, my friend, for all who think of it as just a man invented piece of plastic with a metal ball tip that was created to spread ink, huh. think again. Hello viewers, my name is Will Strickland. I want to welcome you once again to Pro-Life Advice, where you too can have a professional lifestyle. I'm here today with Mr. Joseph Allen Ash Sr., anointed, poetic man of God. He has several books out. He's a poet out of Newark, New Jersey, born and raised, and now he lives in Delaware. But he's here today to give you a little bit of advice about poetry. Joseph, say hello. How y'all doing? All right. So Joseph, tell me a little bit about yourself. I know you were born and raised here in Newark, New Jersey. And as far as the poetry is concerned, when did you really start getting into the poetry and started actually writing or either just doing poems? How did that all come about? I mean, at what age approximately were you? Well, I think I was about 15, I was in high school and it was it was like a big game to me, you know, and it seemed like anything that I wrote just worked for me. It's like everybody was amazed with the things that I wrote, you know what I mean? And okay. I just thought it was just funny. I just thought maybe some people were a little slower than me or something at that time. But, you know, it was just a big game. I never knew how serious this gift was at that time. 
Okay. So you started writing poems in, in grammar school or high school? Where did you actually start? High school. Uh, I think I wrote my first serious poem. As a matter of fact, I think I wrote my first serious poem when I was 14. Hmm. When I was 14, I was in the ninth grade, a freshman at, at uh, Middletown High School. Okay, do you remember what poem, what poem it was? No, as a matter of fact, I don't. I just know that. It just seemed like... And was it a love poem? I mean, back then, a lot of kids had crushes yeah, on the ladies. Yeah, I mean, it was a definite love poem, and it seemed like all the girls went crazy over, over this poem, you know? Okay. And then, you know, later on, by my junior year, I'm going from poetry to... <laughs> writing rap songs. <laughs> okay, now let's pause there for a moment. Now, poetry and rap, a lot of times there's a lot of uh, coincidence and significance in merging between poetry and rap. There's a lot, there's a thin line between poetry and rap. At some point in your life, were you, were you a rapper? I mean, did you do rap at one time? Or? Yeah, I was actually in, actually, from like my junior year up until I guess maybe 26 or 27, you know, I, I I began to write rap songs and try to do recordings and stuff like that, but you know, I'll be honest, the problem that I had is I, some of the things that are displayed in rap songs, you know, uh, I didn't feel comfortable comfortable with. And another thing is, <laughs> I was a man born without rhythm. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so now, that now, became a little problem. Understood. Now, who, who are some of it? Like, if you did rap, who were some of the people that influenced you in the, out there in the rap world? Oh, man, I would have to say, Rock him. Okay. Eric, Rock him, Eric B. Yeah, I would have some to of the favorites say, in the seventies. I mean, not seventies, eighties and nineties. I would mm -hmm. have to say KRS One. KRS One, yeah, he's another man. And I would also have to say DMX. Now these guys are not just rappers. If you really listen to them, mm -hmm. they are poets, and they are really telling a story. You know. Right. Right. Yeah, that's true. They that's are. They are really telling a story. The, the object of poetry, in order to be a good poet is to take the vision from in the back of your own eyes mm. and be able to place it into the back of someone else's eyes. Now, if you can just scream everything from your mind, from your heart, into that paper when you write, mm. if you can just put all of your emotions, just vision, what you're trying to picture to the crowd when you speak, then there's no doubt in my mind. If you're not a great poet, you're on your way. Excellent, excellent. Some excellent advice here in the Pro Life Advice Show. So we're going to pause for a minute. We're actually going to listen to one of Joseph Ash's poets, yeah. poems. And um, you guys tell me what you think. Joseph, tell them what the, what's the name of the poem. Let them know. Oh, this poem is called Addicted. And how did that poem come about? What made you write that poem? Give us a little snapshot of the story. I was going through addiction, and I went okay. to a church. I called myself just having a place to go. It was cold outside. It was a Sunday morning, and... A young man walked up to me, he was only 19 years old, and he said, Sir, do you need prayer? Okay, let's kick, and just one minute, we're going to kick the, uh, the poem, Addiction. Here it is, right. Addiction. <laughs> oh yeah, wait a minute. I got something I need y'all to hear. A young man walks up to me, and he asks, Sir, do you need prayer? Huh. Do I need prayer? Everybody needs prayer. So brother, please pray for me. And then this brother laid hands on me. Now this brother was only 19, but I could tell that he was on Jesus' team. He told me things about myself that I knew he had never seen. He told me that drugs were blocking my blessings. And although I wasn't high at the time, he was right. I was a crack fiend and it was destroying me and my dreams. And more important, I've always had a spot on Jesus' team, but Satan in the form of this drug was having his way and I was killing myself. Lord, I'm done with my past. Please help me to go on. I'm tired of doing wrong. Please teach me and preach to me. I want to grow in your word. I want to be big and strong. Satan, you little monkey, you're messing with King Kong. I'm God's child. The Holy Spirit is in me and my soul is on fire. Satan, you're nothing but a defier and a liar. It's my soul that you desire, but it belongs to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Today I have so much to learn. Let me start by studying your scripture. And when I write and recite poetry, help me to paint the right picture. And don't be so quick to let Satan have his way. Listen, y'all. 
I don't just take words and make them rhyme. I'm in God's presence. I'm on God's time. This is his time to shine. This is his gift, not mine. He supplies me with next line. He gives me the sign. I take it that he's proven to me that I'm definitely on his mind. I didn't write this song, but God, in you I find perfect love. Check this out. The Bible is my utensil. God's word is my drug. The Holy Spirit is the greatest high. Close your eyes. Give God a hug. Feel his love. I thank him for everything that he does. He delivered me from who I was and what I was. Today, God is my drug. And because of his grace, mercy, and love, I stay hard and ever. There is nothing like an ounce of scripture to get you where you need to be. We've tried alcohol and street drugs. Now God is saying, try me. He doesn't come with a white, red, or blue cap, but his containers are as big as they come. Come get a sip of God's word. It's smoother than any rum. You're stronger than 151. Get addicted to God, son. He'll put a sweet taste in your mouth from your tongue to your lungs. Put down your guns. The blood of Lord Jesus was shed for us. I dare y'all to come and get some. He is the only one that can keep us feeling high all day, every day. Trust me, I have tried Christ. And today, I'm a dick. That was a serious yeah. poem, man. I was enjoying that. Yeah, um, it, talk, it, talk, yeah, it talked a lot about how you went through the struggles and how God actually brought you out. Can you give us a little bit more? I mean, you wrote the poem. Tell, tell the audience, what, it was, what was that about? I mean, give uh, us I tell you, story. I, I actually lived that life. I, I've had nights I couldn't feel my fingers and toes. And everybody cut me off, man. Everybody cut me off. I didn't, I didn't have a bridge. They were all burnt down, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? But I, you know, what I've learned is your your twelve step program says your first step is confession. Okay. You know, and then your second step is we came to believe that a power greater than us could restore us back to sanity. Hmm. Well, I didn't go through the programs or nothing like that, but I thank God because I was able to gain this now uh, this knowledge, confession. If we confess with our mouth. Uh, excuse me, if we confess our sins, mm -hmm. he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is in the Amen. Bible. Okay. We came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us back to sanity. That's, that's Jesus. You know, and all I can say is the first two steps of anything that you do are the most important steps. A baby's uh, uh, most important steps are his first two. Okay. The first two steps of anything are the most important in what you're trying to create, what you're trying to do, where you're trying to get to. And those first two steps both told me, turn my life over to God. Okay. All right. Now, I, I, I know you have a book out. What's, what's the name of the book that you, you just uh, released? Well, the book that I just released is called My Mind on Jesus, Incarcerated, But I'm Free. Okay, let's pause right there for a second. Now, Joseph Ash has many different backgrounds. I mean, uh, I'm going to let him actually tell it, but uh, tell the audience of some, some of your testimony, some of the things you've been through that, that actually strengthened you to this point and made you who you are today. I've been a man that was homeless. I've been a man that was strung out on drugs. I've been a man that you couldn't tell anything to. Uh, I actually wrote my first book, The Songs of Prayers of Joseph, in a homeless shelter. Hmm. And what it was, was it was my personal relationship with God. Also, my second book, that was just released, uh, I wrote that in prison. Once again, I kept my mind on Jesus, my personal relationship with God. Now, you know, just to briefly tell you some of the stories, you know, um, when I go to my Bible, not to preach, but uh, I realized that Daniel was in the lion's den. He made it up by keeping his mind on Jesus. Mm -hmm. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego Amen, stepped brother. into the furnace. Mm -hmm. they, kept, they, they made it through by keeping their faith, keeping their mind on God. Therefore, while I was incarcerated, I realized that the only way to really get through this is to keep my mind on Jesus. And my personal relationship with God, everything that I believe that anyone needs to hear to advance in life, to, to, to really achieve their goals, is to keep their mind on Jesus. And everything in that book is telling you my thoughts, my personal prayers while I was incarcerated. Amen. So, Joseph, before we go, I mean, I want to thank you for coming on the Pro-Life Advice Show. And also, um, being that this is an advice show, give the audience, I mean, there's, there's, I'm sure there's a lot of aspiring poets out there. And, and um, what are some of the things that, that you want to share 
that can actually help them get over the hump and help them be more successful. Give, give, give uh, the expiring poets a little bit of advice. Never listen to anyone tell you you can't do. That's number one. Hmm. Everything is possible. The second thing is take everything that you know that somebody else is just not going to understand if you tell them. Everything that's really on your heart and you sink yourself, sink your entire imagination into that paper. And one thing for sure, your story will not be what somebody else's story will be. And when you speak it, you'll not only, you'll not only be saying how you feel, but you'll be expressing how you feel. And somebody's got to love you. One thing for sure, if you're a poet, God meant for you to be heard. Therefore, if you give your all and you just let it pour, let it pour, cry. If that's what you have to do, you cry. You pour everything that you have to understand that the way I see it is like the things that are on my mind may save someone else's life. Amen. And so therefore, Eric B., uh, Rakim said, I sink into the paper like I was ink. I've never forgotten that and that's exactly what I try to do when I write. All right. Well, thanks for coming on the Pro Life Advice Show, Joseph. I thank you for having me, sir. All right. And listen, you too, stick around, and you can be a professional poet like Mr. Joseph Allen Ash Sr. Stay tuned at the Pro Life Advice Show. Pro Life Advice, where you too can be a professional. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, y'all. Medea might say right about here, Hallelujah. Anyway, we're going to kick it mind, body, and soul with the next artist, Troy Balkum. Did you know the production of Hip Hop Spits was caused by the elicitation of definitive responses to the art of making hits, giving you funky stimuli, then on the rebound, the art of making you uncontrollably high through vibe. How high? Height depends on the artist. Some cool, some not. Some with live hip hop sounds, and some weakened as it's full of snot. Do more than just listen to my speech, yo. In clothes, we will find pages of everlasting flows. I know you've been searching for a new, so here's your cue. Pick up a book and read and feed your mind to develop your decorum. Be that cat going to class and not the one looking back saying, I could have a future. Hey, man, you got a quarter? Look at you, hanging all night at bars and stealing cars. And I told you to stay away from that kid Bryce out there in the street all night shooting dice. How long you think that's going to last? One day you're going to run out of gas and then you're going to be a blast from the past. Oh yeah, I knew you'd be taking those cars down the block at that place they call Jake's Chop Shop and running numbers for that kid, little Knot. Son, son, what do you want to be in this life? How are you going to live your life? A grain of sand in a lost land filled with people with no role because you lost all that wish to made you whole. Your family, your shorty, your cream, your self-esteem, your game, and now your name. No one wants to be associated with a cat with no name. You might as well be holding up leaves from one of these trees and at least you get paid some air to breathe. But see, if you don't go to school, you wouldn't be able to appreciate that, you sap. Go in that corner, go take a nap. But check it out. Check it out. On the flip side of that, you could be the main attraction, the one receiving satisfaction, just stay in school. You could be the one with loot, the one wearing those Versace suits, just stay in school. You could be the one with a refined game that cuts like a clean incision that was developed through hard work and now operates with pristine precision, telling us in the street brothers to just shut up and take a listen. Son. Son, don't be nobody's fool. Just stay in school. Son, what do you want to be in this life? A, a doctor. doctor. Son, what do you want to be in this life? A, a lawyer. lawyer. Son, how you going to live your life? A I mega hip-hop hip -hop star. star. Want to switch your gears and you'll go far. My name is Will Strickland. I'm here today from Pro-Life Advice. Thanks again, viewers, for tuning in. I'm here today with DJ Little Man out of Newark, New Jersey. One of our own, DJ Little Man. That's right, out of Newark, New Jersey. Born and raised in Newark, New Jersey. All right? All right. It's the Strickland. All right. <laughs> so, so, little man, tell me, you've been doing this for quite some time. How long have you been a DJ? I've been the DJ for approximately, prior, I want to say about 10 to 11 years. Strong, 10 to, 10 to 11 years. 10 to 11 years. Yeah. Okay. Where, where'd you start? I mean, did you start in your basement, out of the club? Or where? I started at a record shop. I wasn't even like an in-house DJ. I started at Big Al Records. Shout out to Big, Big Al. Al's. Yeah, I know Big Al's back in the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. On, on Wash, West Market Street in mm -hmm. Newark, New Jersey, I started there. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's 
that was my home. That was my basement. That was my backyard. <laughs> okay. All right. And since then, you, you started. You migrated into clubs, or you you did house parties. How, how did how did it all come? I mean, out? from there we went. It went straight to the parks. I, I never had like a house party. I never had like a club uh, party. Big Al used to have me set up parks, and I start opening up at the parks. And when you uh, mean parks, like like weekday park, talking, like, park, places like uh, that. Uh, uh, South Mount Reservation, wow. uh, okay. weekday. Uh, Branch Brook Park, like family, family reunions, family gatherings, stuff like that. So okay, cool. it started out in parks. A lot of people probably started in houses and basements, and I started in a store and in the park. Right, right, right. <laughs> now, now, as far as music, because I know everyone has some type of history. Who actually was your mentor? Like, as, as an example, was it a friend or a family? Was your dad a DJ? Was it someone it that was inspired you? My uncles. My uncle Fa, he's an underground DJ. Uh, my uncle Dave, they were DJs. They used to do the house parties with the family. So, you know, we was the kids. So the, the house party would be inside of an apartment building on the fourth floor, and all the kids would be upstairs on the sixth floor and the, with an older cousin. So it was like, you know, my uncles was the one who put, the, like, the icing on the cake. So shout out to, you know, my uncles. Okay, so you started... Playing with the uh, wheels back in, and then all of a sudden you started liking it. I mean, to be yeah. honest, I didn't even start on Technique twelve hundreds. Mm. I started on CDJs and, and and strips, CD power strips. So I mean, a, a lot of people be like, "Well, he's a he's a a, 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 a digital DJ," but I started <laughs> on digital, and I and then I went backwards right. and started doing vinyl. So I mean, I mm. I got my history together. <laughs> okay, now tell us, uh, aside the music. Who is DJ Little Man? I mean, are you? Did you? What, what high school did you grow to? Go to and then. I mean, DJ Little Man was a a young lost soul before before music. So I want to say he was just a a normal person. Just uh, you know, I used to go to Dr. Yama Flag Elementary School, so I was around a lot of uh, Puerto Ricans and Dominicans and. So I was sub Espanol. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, <laughs> see, 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 see. So I was around a lot of Puerto Ricans and Dominicans, and, and um, you know, I went to Barringer High School. Barringer. Okay. I went to Barringer in North North, so I still was around a lot of Puerto Ricans. So I, I was one of those uh, uh, uh Spanglish speakers, mm -hmm. one of those Spanish and English speakers. So you know, I mean, that's what I used to do. I used to play basketball and run track. So hmm. that was my my main focus was basketball and track. You know. Okay. Did you ever like go to the pen relays or anything like that? Yeah, 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 yeah. I did the Olympics. I did the pen relays. Um, wow. I did a lot of youth. Okay. Uh, 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 basketball tournaments and stuff like that, street versus streets, uh, town versus towns, parks versus parks type of thing, you know, um, Puerto Ricans versus Dominican type of thing. I even had my coaching on for a little bit. I was doing my little coaching. Now, now you, got this, you got this hip t-shirt on. Tell us a little bit about this shirt. Yeah, what's, what's yeah, going on? yeah. What's, Team Lil' Man. Team Lil' Man. You know, got the website, DJ Lil' Man 973.com, you know. It's just I'm a brand. I gotta make sure that people know, man. DJ Little Man all day. That's it. You hear that, viewers? He's not only a DJ. He's an entrepreneur. Yes, I am. Great stuff. Yeah, so listen, yeah. We're gonna come back in just a minute. We're gonna take a quick minute at one of his videos. Yeah, keep it locked right here. Check out this Jersey Slide video right here. All right. All right. Check it out. Here we go. Uh, oh. Uh, oh. I like really wanted to just try something uh, oh. different. You know, we always uh, uh, recycling uh, stuff and just man. doing all of that. So. Man. I just want to try this New Jersey oh, slide right here. Here we go. Uh, Two steps to the left. Got your car in the middle of the street. To the right. Got your trunk. Two steps to the slide.
with DJ Little Man. That video was hot. There's a lot of dancing going on. I remember back in the day when I used to be in a move like that. I'm sure I could probably you, you try. You still got it. You got a couple moves. You I know, do the two-step. It's Mr. Will right here. It's Mr. Will. <laughs> Maybe I can handle the two-step and a couple of spins and a hustle, but I don't know about all those wiggle with it and slide to the left. You got that yeah. was the Jersey. Tell me, it was the, the Jersey, Jersey slide. slide? Jersey, Jersey slide. slide. You know, a matter of fact, you could just let me just turn around a little bit. You can see that. Can you see that Jersey slide? Jersey slide. You see that? Yeah, that's, that's yeah, 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 yeah. Man, I, I really, didn't, I had no idea that he, this really <laughs> is a true entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah. Now, on that note, we're going to talk a little bit about um, how do you really give people advice on on how to become a successful DJ like yourself? I mean, you know, speak to the audience and tell tell these kids. There's a lot of young kids out there who are playing music right now in their basement, boys and girls, I'm sure. You know, there's some ladies who want to be DJs as well. What's some advice you can? I mean, share? the only thing I can basically say is surround yourself with people that actually support you as a as DJ. Like, you know, you got to surround yourself with those type of people and uh, believe in yourself. It's gonna take a lot of time. You just gotta go for it and don't stop. Just keep it going. Um, just stay humble and hungry. You know, uh, when you do get those chance to shine and when you do get those times, that, you know, to show people off, just give it your all all the time. Like, even when you're sick, tired, and just don't want to do it no more, that's when you should just be able to go harder with it. So, I mean, just stay focused at the end of the day. You know, surround, surround yourself with people that actually believe in you and that you it's have not, the talent. Right, you know what I'm saying? Not. That's it. That's all. Also, um, there's, there's a lot of times people... You know, have a, a sometimes people have negative connotation about yeah. DJs and parties. Um, can you give our viewers a little bit of advice on, on, on when they go to parties that come out and and you want to make the party a safe environment and 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 uh, I just I just like violence. I said before, you know, I throw parties at the end of the day, so I know what it's like to have uh, to not have something to do. Um, but right now, if you look at in North New Jersey in the Essex County area, as you can see, it's really nothing for kids to do. So, I mean, if you just look at that and just take that in and just, you know, go with that mindset and as I'm going to have a great time and, and just leave all the BS to the side and stuff like that. So, I mean, when you're going out to party, it might not be you that's starting stuff. It might be somebody else, but it's always your decision. Just make that decision to just turn away and just walk the opposite and just go. So, I mean, like I said before, you know, um, we don't have too much for the kids to do right now. So, I mean, just cherish that. Okay, that's excellent advice. One other thing I want to say before we go. Now, I saw a lot of dancing going on. I mean, are you... Are you Teaching these dances, or what's what's the relationship the, between the music, the DJing, and the dancing? I mean, the relationship between them all is uh Jersey. Jersey teens are doing the dances. The Jersey DJs like me and Frosty are putting it together. Mm -hmm. Then we have our Jersey supporters that's helping us push it all the way out. So I mean, Jersey. I mean, dancing is the new thing. That's the new thing right what, now. What are they know? calling it now? I remember it was Pop Lock and what's <laughs> It's just, it's just whatever we name the song. Are you not to do that new little man? You not to do that. <laughs> that's, that's what it is. So All I right. mean, this is a lot of, it's a mixture of different dances that's in there. So that's good stuff. Okay. Just dancing right now. All right, so what's what's some of your short-term goals right now? You're looking to do something? What, what, what's coming up? I mean, my short-term goals has always, all, already been accomplished. I keep kids off the street for uh, for four to five hours every event that I throw. So, And not only is it two to four, it's like, you know, a thousand kids. So my, my short-term goals are accomplished right now. You know, I have the youth right here. You know, whenever I say it's a go, it's a go. Whenever I say no, it's no. So right now my short-term goals is like, I don't think my short-term goals can be any any higher than what they are right now. So mm -hmm. I want to say I accomplished my short-term goals. And some of your long-term, what are some of the things you're looking to do um, in the future? I want to open up my teen club. You know, something for the kids. I want to I want to I want to open up something something invo involving the youth. You know, a, a, a youth organization, chess club, checker checker club, or a lounge, or you know, video arcade or something like that. Just a place for kids to just go and and free their mind. You know, they go to school Monday through Friday and. They working so hard. Some of them, even the ones that's not really working, they try and they just get up and go to school. They just need a place that where they could just chill and relax and just and just not have to worry about no tests, no 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 SATs, and you know, mom getting on my nerves. I just want to just right. have a time to myself. It's, it's, I might call it the me club. Okay. When it's all about me. <laughs> <laughs> all right, now viewers, before we go, we're gonna learn a little something about DJ Little Man as, as well. Yeah. How did you get the name DJ Little Man? I was, I want to say about 13, 12, 13, and I was the youngest um, young man around a, a whole bunch of men. Uh, like I said, I started DJing. Before I was DJing and all that stuff, I was outside selling CDs in front of Big Al Records on West Market Street. So I was there with my uncle, and uh, Big Al came and bought this place. It was a laundromat first, 
And what I did was, in the process of him gutting it and doing all of that stuff like that, I asked Al, did he need help? And so Al was like, yeah, come here, youngin. Come here, little bro. And every time he had called me to bring something, screws, spackle, whatever the case, bring it to him. Little bro, young man, little man. And then, you know, it, it just went on from there. Everybody that was there was just calling me little man, little man, little man, little man. And I just stuck with it. I just... I just kept it going, DJ Lil, man. It was a joke at first, but it kind of sticks. So, I mean, everybody, black man, my mom's called me black man. I mean, Lil, man, it's just, you know, a nickname that was given to me from the people that I looked up to when, when I in the, in the music thing, you know, the people that actually showed me and gave me the the glow to run with it. So, I mean, that, that that's just the name I'm running with, you know? Okay, excellent, excellent, excellent. And to be honest with you, I've, I've, I've talked to many youth out there, lots of uh, kids who are age 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 18, and, and they really like what you're doing. They're, yeah. they're into the music. They can relate. Yeah, they're into a lot the of music, people they're can't into relate. the steps, and so on and so forth, because a lot, a lot of them want to get, there's so much energy that they have, and they want to channel, channel this energy in a positive and, way. And that's exactly, what that was my mindset, and, and, and when, I, when I do these dances and stuff, that's the mindset, because there's a lot of anger, angry kids, there's a lot of uh, yeah. abused children out there that just feel like, oh, I just want to hurt, and I, this music is their outlet, like, you know, they just get the music, and they just like, they run with it. Sometimes their moms get on their nerves, or anybody get on their nerves. They go in their room and turn their music up. That's what I did when I was young. I ain't, I couldn't hit mommy back. I couldn't do none of that. So I just went in my room and turned my music up, and that was my outlet. It calmed me down and just you know just relax. And then eventually you fall asleep because that's what music does. It tires you. It makes you Sue, tired. Sue's the savage beast. Yeah. So I want to thank you, little man, again <laughs> for coming on the Pro Life Advice Show. Yeah. Now I want to thank you, man. Shout you know this, Mr. Will Strictly. Subscribe to this right here. You know, um, shout out to Pro Life and Advice. Show. I mean, thank you for having me up here. Oh, yeah. you know? Excellent. And he's been such an inspiration to the youth. And we're looking forward to him doing bigger. Yeah, other yeah. things in Newark, New Jersey. Newark. Again, thanks for watching the Pro Life Advice Show where you too can be a professional. Jersey. Hi, everybody. Who are you? Tell us your name. Hey, it's Miss Teresa, the Queen of New Jersey. I'm here having a great time.